Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to Summit. My name is Grant. I'm one of the student ministries pastors here, and uh, I'm really excited to uh, kind of just share my heart with you uh, about uh, what we've been talking about. And today, uh, we're in week two of our current teaching series titled Without Love. And uh, before we get into the text, I just would like to give you a little bit of context as to what is going on. I always think that it's really important that you understand the context as to what you're reading when you're reading through Scripture. Um, A lot of people like to just grab a verse and say, I like that verse. It sounds neat. And they just kind of go off and make it sound like whatever they want it to sound like. And so uh, what we're talking about today is uh, is in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It's often referred to as the love chapter. Some of you might have it on the wall in your house, and you've heard it at a wedding like Nick talked about last week. But uh, there was a man, and his name was Paul. He was actually an apostle uh, sent by God to proclaim the gospel to to the Gentiles, to people who did not believe in God necessarily. And um, in the process of that, he planted a church in the city of Corinth. Um, And the city of Corinth was was on uh, an ancient trade route, and so it had a lot of hustle and bustle. I think if I was to give you an an accurate uh, depiction of a modern-day city, you could almost say it was kind of like New York City. It was very fast-paced. There were tons of people who were going and coming and going and trying to to make it. And and there were a lot of talented people, a lot of ambitious people. And and as Paul was writing this letter, he was writing the letter to a group of people that he knew, to a group of people that he loved and that he cared for. And it would be uh, the equivalent of Brad maybe writing us a letter while he was on sabbatical of maybe God inspiring some things in his heart for the church that he, that he is a pastor of and, and then sending it to them so we could read it. Obviously, Brad would probably send us an email because it's 2015. He probably wouldn't write us a letter. That would be weird. I'm just kidding. Write letters. It's still okay. Um, but so, so that's a little bit of context as to what's happening in this letter that we're looking at. And so Paul heard that things weren't going so well with the church in Corinth. They may have had a lot going on as a city, but they were very broken as a church. Um, and Paul was inspired by the Holy Spirit to, to write what we're reading and send it to this church in love and care, in correction and in teaching. And so as we read through this, I want you just to kind of be mindful of that, that this was a real letter written to like a group of people very similar to us who all have jobs and lives and we're, we're trying to make it and raise kids and, and get a wife or get a husband and, and do life, right? And so as we read through this, I just want you to be mindful of the context of the, the heart of this letter from Paul for these people inspired by God. Uh, if you have your Bible, we're going to read through it. It's only four short verses this morning. Um, some of you are like, praise Jesus, four verses, and then I'm going home. Uh, but 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 4, we're going to read through that and then we'll move forward, okay? It reads like this. If I could speak all of the languages of earth and of angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor, and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Love is patient and kind. Would you pray with me? Lord, would you make this scripture come to life for us? Would you speak to us? Would this would your word accomplish what you sent sent it to do in our hearts, just as you sent it to do in the hearts of the people of Corinth? Love is such an elementary thing, but it's such a big deal, God, and I pray that you would help us comprehend your love for us more deeply this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So uh, a little bit ago, I'm going to say three years ago, I went to the store, I bought some paint brushes, I bought some paint, I bought a notebook, a doodle notebook, I bought some canvas, and I was embarking on a journey to become the next great artist of our time. Uh, Mind you, I had never painted anything before in my life. 25 years old is a little late in life to decide that you want to be an artist, but I figured, what the heck, I got a shot at this. 
Uh, one of my roommates at the time, his name was Isaac. If you were at church last week, Isaac led worship. Um, I had lived with Isaac for two years, and he is an incredible artist. I sat at the kitchen table with him eating breakfast or a late night snack, and I watched him just like grab a piece of paper and just like doodle these incredible pieces of art or paint something awesome. And so the whole time I was living with him, I was a little bit jealous because he's one of those people who just makes it look so easy. Do you know what I'm talking about? And so I was like, I moved out of the house, got married. I was like, I'm going to show Isaac. I'm going to show him I'm just like him. I'm an artiste. I sat down. I sat down and my art career lasted a whole of two hours. Um, I struggled with painting a straight line. Uh, my circles looked more like a lopsided egg that was leaning to the left. And I genuinely was trying as hard as I possibly could. I even said, I even said okay, I'm not going to try to do shapes. I'm going to do letters. I'm going to, like, love is patient. Literally. And I'm going to frame it and give it to my wife. There is higher quality art done in the five-year-old classroom here on a Sunday than what I produced in those two hours at the kitchen table by myself. It was, it was a train wreck, to say the least. Have any of you ever sat, set out on, on or embarked on some sort of, I'm going to do this, but then in the process, you, it was made aware that you were lacking something clearly in the process? Has anybody done that before? Raise your hand if you've done that. Okay. Some of you are like, I'm an athlete. Pick up a basketball, backboard, over the hoop, right? Some of you are like, I am going to be a gentleman and a scholar, and then you go sit in a college classroom and you have no idea what the professor is talking about and all he's doing is saying hello, right? We have all experienced this when, when your desire doesn't match up with your ability and it is disheartening at times, right? And I was a little frustrated to say the least and we lived in an apartment complex at the time and I marched out to the dumpster and just said, see ya, paint, life, I'm done with you. I'm just going to go back to doing me and I'm going to let the artists be the artists, right? Um, it's so easy, but I think that, I think to that end, there is something inside of all of us that wants to produce things of quality, things of purpose with our abilities. Do you know what I'm saying? You want to produce something of value. You want to produce something with purpose behind it. But when our abilities don't match up with our desires, there's a little bit of like uh, not, not very well-oiled machine going on inside of us. And in my attempt to become an artist, it was very clear what I was lacking. I was lacking artistic ability. I can't draw anything, but I thought I could paint something. Unlike abilities such as artistic skills, athleticism, or genius, there is an ability that every single person in this room possesses. And they possess it with a tremendous capacity, and that's the ability to love. Just look to the person next to you and say, you are a love machine. Mm. You are a love machine. You really are. Like, I, I, human beings are capable of incredible love. But on the flip side, we're incapable of incredible evil at the same time, right? And so as we're sticking with the topic of what Paul's speaking of, he's talking about love. He's talking about not the fluffy idea of love, but real love. But a life lived void of love is meaningless. And Paul goes to great lengths to prove that point in the setup of this text. Check this out. I'm going to break it down just a little bit. In verse 1, he writes, if I could speak all of the languages of earth and of angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. To the citizens of Corinth, this would have made great sense. They would have completely comprehended what he was getting at. Because in pagan temples, the way that they began a worship service was they would, just, they would just make noise and try to get everyone's attention. Does it sound like a band jam a little bit? Uh, no, I'm just kidding. But that was their heart was just, hey, let's just make some noise and just get everyone's attention. Let's just put on a show. There are roughly 6,500 spoken languages on this earth right now. Could you imagine a human being that could speak every single one of them? Have you ever been around somebody who's bilingual? Anybody? How many people in the room can speak two languages? Don't be shy. That's awesome. How many of you could speak three languages? No one, right? 6,500 languages. Paul's being a little bit facetious here, but he's saying if I could speak every language on earth, and if I had the gift of speaking in tongues, 
but I did it absent of love. I'm just a noisemaker. I'm just a showman. It's just all about, hey, look at this. Look at this. Paul points to how important love is when it comes to producing anything of purpose, anything of value. He moves on then to continue to build on that point. If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans, if you understand someone's secret plan, it's not a secret anymore, by the way. I know your secret. And I possessed all knowledge. And if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but didn't love others, I would be nothing. Paul's remarks here again are facetious. If he had the gift of prophecy, a prophet is someone who has the, the gift of proclaiming God's truth so that people can know it and understand it. If I could do that, but I did it absent of love, it's worthless. I am nothing as a man if I do that. If I could understand all secrets and all mysteries, I am nothing without love. If I possessed all knowledge, all knowledge, not just, hey, you know a lot about this, or a lot about this and a little bit of this, all knowledge. That's absurd to think about, right? All knowledge about everything. But I do that absent of love, I am nothing as a man. If I had such faith that I could move mountains, Paul says that if he possessed every single one of these incredible gifts, every single one of these incredible talents, if he could dunk a basketball while drawing a beautiful picture and getting a perfect score on the SAT at the same time, he is nothing as a man. But our culture holds all of those things in such high regard when we possess just one of them, right? And then lastly, Paul says this, if I gave everything, say everything. Everything means everything that you have. If I gave everything, I have to the poor and even sacrificed my own body. If I died a martyr's death in the name of Jesus Christ for the glory of God, I could boast about it. I could say, look what I did. People would even maybe say, man, look at what he did. Look at what she did. That's incredible. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Again and again, Paul makes the point that a life lived absence of love is worthless. Summed up neatly, the loveless person produces nothing, is nothing, and gains nothing. That's rough to say, right? It's rough to absorb that a little bit. But man, I tried really hard. I tried really hard. Absent of love, we produce nothing, we are nothing, and we gain nothing. Love is a big deal, is what Paul's getting at in short. Love is the biggest deal. When Jesus was asked, hey, what's the greatest commandment? He said, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Love is and always will be a big deal to God. We cannot grow beyond love when it comes to growing in our faith. You can't. It's not like you become more mature once you get the elementary principle of love. You grow in love, never beyond love. God loves you. If you've sat in church service here before, you've probably heard that said before. And that's a fact. And we never can move beyond that. God absolutely loves you. But I want to go a step further in something that often is overlooked at times, God also loves other people. Not just you. Does he just love you? Absolutely. There is this very specific individual reality to God's love for you. But there also is a love for, of God for everyone in this room. God doesn't love me more than he loves Matthias but yet he loves us both the same within a tremendous passion. But knowing that God loves you intellectually and experiencing God's love for you, we're never meant to be separated. I have a 10-month-old daughter today. Her name is Esther Ann. She's pretty much the cutest thing I've ever seen. I have a picture for you. That was her dad. I want some Cheerios, Smirk. 
But I love that little girl, and, and, I, and if you've sat here before, you've heard me just gush over her. I mean, how could I not, right? But at 10 months old, when I open up the door and I walk in the house, Esther goes nuts. And Esther doesn't go nuts because I sit down and I tell her, hey, I really want you to comprehend this. I would do anything for you. Absolutely anything. Like, you, you, I would do it all for you. She understands my love for her because when I walk in the door, I set my stuff down, I give my wife a kiss on the cheek, I say, hi, how are you? I get down, I get down on the floor at her level. We play with her toys together. She experiences my love for her. She experiences my love for her when I sit down. I love to read her the story of Esther. It's like one of my favorite things to do because I say, hey, there was this woman, her name was Esther. She lived a long time ago and God did something incredible in her life. And that's why we named you Esther, because we really believe that God wants to do something amazing in your life. And, and she just rips at the page, and I'm like crying, and she could care less. She's like spitting up. <laughs> but when she tips over because she's trying to figure out how to walk and crawl and, and hits her head on the carpet, I'm there to pick her up, and she experiences my love for her. The same is true with God. You can sit here, and I can talk to you about the love of God. You can experience it intellectually. You can understand God's love for you intellectually. You can understand God's love for one another intellectually. But God's love was meant to be known intellectually and experienced through life. The two are supposed to go together. And it's very easy to separate the two as Christians. Oh no, I know that love, but I don't live that love. Life is filled with evidence that God loves us. It's full of it. But the most powerful evidence of God's love for us is Jesus. Everything that Jesus did during his time here on earth was full with love. In other words, Jesus was never without love. In every conversation he had, in every miracle he performed, in everything he taught, in every breath he took, Jesus did it with the fullness of love embodied like no one else before him or after him. I think that the appropriate question to ask in light of what Paul just presented to us, that without love, our life is worthless, is then, well, what is love? <laughs> Baby, don't hurt me. Don't hurt me no more. <laughs> Paul moves past what we've discussed into literally one of the most brilliant, one of the most comprehensive depictions of love that you will find in the Bible outside of a biblical narrative of Jesus. If you want to know what love is, look at a story that has Jesus in it. But Paul breaks down love in a way that is so applicable, is so practical, is so challenging and difficult to understand. But instead of just telling us what love is, Paul tells us what love does. And I really want you to understand that. In this, in this verse that you've heard a million times, it's not just a, a discourse off of adjectives. It's a discourse of verbs. I find it interesting that every single English translation contains adjectives, but the original Greek words are all verbs in their original forms. Love just isn't, love does. Love acts, love moves. Love is to be, meant to be experienced as well as comprehended. You see, love isn't just an idea or an emotion or a feeling, but is it an idea, an emotion, and a feeling? Absolutely. But it's not just those things. In the, in the few coming weeks, we're going we're gonna to take a look at what Paul says love does and what love does not. But today we're going to take a, a, just a look, a brief look at two things in particular that love does. At the beginning of verse 4, it just says plain, plain and simply, love is patient and kind. There it is. Just be patient and kind. We'll pray and you can go home. If it was that easy, right? First, let's talk about being patient. Love is patient. Would you say that with me? Love is patient. The English definition of patient is able to remain calm and not become annoyed when waiting for a long time for your food at a restaurant or dealing with problems or the kicker, difficult people. How many of you know a difficult person in the room? How many of you are a difficult person? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm a difficult person. I would be that guy. Fun fact, you'll always have difficult people in your life. It's an unavoidable reality. 
go outside, <laughs> go to the grocery store, get a job, you are always going to interact with difficult people. Paul isn't just talking about feeling patient, he's talking about practicing patience, actively engaging in patience towards another human being. I want to specify that just feeling patient and practicing patience are a little bit different, right? You might order something online. You being patient for it to show up is not patient. You're waiting for something for yourself. Patience is something that you can extend to another person who is incredibly trying on your soul, who is incredibly trying on your life. Something that trips us up and prevents us from loving other people through patience is what I want to call the microwave effect. Track with me here for a minute. We want to take the difficult person, throw them in the microwave, push 30 seconds, wait for the dinger to go off, open the door, boom! No longer difficult. It doesn't work with people. It works with Hot Pockets. And Hot Pockets are disgusting, but just for the record, don't eat Hot Pockets. God loves you more than that. I'm going to burn my mouth with a bunch of hot rubber. But people take time. People aren't something that you can just expedite the process on. You can't pay $30 for faster shipping to make someone become more mature and grow. People take time. And that time that it takes for a person to mature and grow isn't dictated by your timetable for them. Come serve in student ministries if you want to experience that in the fullness. I'll give you a background check and you can start next week. Junior hires take time. High schoolers take time. Difficult adults take time. The next time that you have an opportunity to practice patience with a difficult person or with just your wife or your husband or your children or your neighbor, I want you to be reminded of how incredibly patient God has been with you. Because when you look at it that way, it changes everything. It flips it all upside down. I am blown away at how patient God has been with me. But when you think about how patient God has been with you, it empowers you to be patient with other people. And I just want to say one more thing before we move on to kindness. The next time that you start to feel those emotions of impatience, be reminded that that's not loving. A lack of patience is not loving. God's love for us is full of patience, and our love for others is to be as well. And now moving on to kindness. Love is kind. Would you say that with me? Love is kind. We live in a hard world. And because of that, there is opportunity upon opportunity upon opportunity for you and I to exercise the difficult reality of being kind. I want to note that feeling kind and practicing kindness are different as well. It takes effort to actively be kind to all people, not just the people that you prefer or the people that you like. I'm just going to say, I struggle with both of these incredibly. <laughs> I'm incredibly impatient, and I can be so unkind at times. But I really want you to hear my heart in these things. It's strange that from a young age, we can be taught to be kind, but our world doesn't reflect anything of that. It's, it's, it's true. Everyone I know teaches their children to be kind, but how do we grow up into, us, into such unkind people? Kindness is countercultural. Kindness makes people uncomfortable. The smallest gesture of kindness is actually perceived as a threat in our culture now because it's so rare to have it happen. What do you mean, you're, dude? Don't touch, don't open that door for me. Don't look at me like that. What are you looking at me like that for? Right? One commentator nailed it on the head when he said this, to be kind means to be useful, serving, and gracious. It's active goodwill. It not only feels generous, 
but is generous? I want you to hear these questions that I'm going to ask you and, and understand that I just want to preface it and say I'm asking you these questions in love because I sat down and asked myself these questions as I wrote this sermon. The first question I want to ask you, and I want you not to think about the person sitting next to you, I want to ask you this question specifically. Are you useful to other people even when it might be at your own expense? I'm not talking about people pleasing. I'm talking about you being useful to the people around you even when it might cost you something. Do you serve other people even when it might inconvenience you? Are you gracious to others when they are undeserving of your grace? And lastly, are you actively generous towards other people? And if you answered yes to any of those things, I would say kudos. But I would also ask you, are you doing those things in love? Or are you doing them so that you will be perceived as a loving, gracious, kind servant? Again, love does. Love is an action to be expressed. And the people that we show it to around us is, is what matters. We love because God loves us. We are patient because God has been incredibly long-suffering and patient with us. We are kind because God over and over and over again pours out his kindness upon us. I'm going to invite the worship team to come out. And I want to close today with, with a biblical narrative of Jesus. Because I think I could tell you a story about something that I did that was patient. I could tell you a story about someone that I know that was incredibly kind. But the most clear, the most powerful evidence of God's love for us, the most clear, the most powerful evidence of love is found when we look at Jesus. John Chapter 8 reads like this. Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives because he was a baller and he ate olives. I'm just kidding, it doesn't say that. But early the next morning, he was back again at the temple and a crowd soon gathered as he sat and taught them. Jesus was a teacher, it's what he did. And he spoke with such power that people had never experienced it before, so they just came to hear the man talk. As he was speaking, the teachers of the religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the very act of adultery. Notice it says the act of adultery. They put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. That means to kill her by throwing rocks at her. What do you say, Jesus? They were trying to trap him into saying something that, could be, that they could use against him. They were trying to see if Jesus was unloving. They were trying to see if Jesus had a flaw, if Jesus had a chink in the armor. But Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. They kept demanding an answer. So he stood up again and said, all right, I'll play this game with you. But let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. He acknowledged the law right there and said, you're right. She's guilty of death. The sin that she committed, she deserves to die. But the one, of you, the one amongst you who's never sinned, you throw the first stone. Then he stooped down again and wrote in the dust. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, because old people are biggest sinners of them all. Just kidding. Until only Jesus was left. And I, I want you just to imagine this for a minute. Imagine there's a woman standing up here and I'm like, hey, I caught her in the act of adultery. And then Jesus says, hey, there's a stone under your rock or under your, under your seat, pick it up. And the one amongst you who's never sinned, you can throw the first stone at this woman. And one by one, starting with Bill Trainer, you all left. 
until it was just Jesus and that woman. I love you, Bill. Until it was just Jesus and that woman standing there. Could you imagine the shame that that woman felt? Could you imagine how disrespected she could feel? Could you imagine how broken she was? And Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. The woman was guilty. She deserved death. Jesus didn't question that. And without love, that is exactly what that woman would have received, death. But you see, love is powerful. Love is life-changing. Love is transforming. The love of Jesus Christ has the ability to to, to soften the the hardest heart. And in Jesus' patience with this woman, she experienced his love for her. And in Jesus' kindness towards this woman, she experienced his love for her. And through knowing and experiencing Jesus' love for her, this woman's life was radically changed. She didn't receive what she deserved, which was death, but she received life. It's the same as when we love one another, that we could be an extension of God's love in the way that we treat one another is absurd. That God would use us to be an extension of his love. What an incredible privilege it is to be able to do that. When you know the love of Jesus is for us, and when you experience how life-giving and how life-changing his love is, then we are empowered to live lives of great purpose and of value. Then we are empowered to live lives where we can extend patience when it's the last thing in the world that we're able to do. Then we're able to give kindness when that person doesn't deserve kindness. Because Jesus' love changes everything. Would you stand with me as we close in worship?